And do we still get the little thing on the screen to tell us that we're recording that whole thing? It doesn't look like it's up there, but uh, you're up. Okay. Uh, good morning. Today is Tuesday, March 8th. It's uh, 9.50 a.m. And this is the morning meeting of Senate Natural Resources and Energy. We're going to be talking about uh, two bills this morning. That's 281, an act relating to hunting coyotes with dogs. And S-129, an act relating to the management of fish and wildlife. Okay, uh, with that, I uh, wanted to start. We asked council to come in uh, for two reasons. One was to give us uh, a little bit of background on the way that statute and rulemaking works to create the rules or the laws around um, uh, hunting and fishing. So for instance, uh, can the, can the uh, Fish and Wildlife Board engage in rulemaking of its own accord? Can the department engage in rulemaking of its own accord? Uh, what's the normal process for how we end up engaging the Fish and Wildlife Board? And, um, and in what cases does the legislature need to act? What's its role in all of this? So thank you, Mr. O'Grady. If you can remind us of how that system works. Um, this is Mike O'Grady with the Office of the Legislative Council. Unfortunately, I don't have any uh, documents or products to share with you but I can refer you to um, some specific statutory sections that you can um, use to review uh, what I'm about to tell you. Uh, so generally under the constitution, the Vermont General Assembly is the uh, ultimate policy making body for the purposes of determining and um, drafting and acting legislation. With regard to uh, the animals, the wildlife of the state, um, the General Assembly clarified a few years ago in 10 VSA 4081 that is provided in the Constitution, Chapter 2, Section 67. The Fish and Wildlife of Vermont are held in trust by the state for the benefit of the citizens of Vermont and shall not be reduced to private ownership. The state of Vermont in its sovereign capacity as a trustee for the citizens of the state shall have ownership, jurisdiction, and control of all of the fish and wildlife of Vermont. That effectively means that the wildlife of Vermont are held as a public trust resource. Uh, the General Assembly is the trustee. They are the one that hold the wildlife um, in trust for the citizens of the state. However, uh, the public trust trustee, the General Assembly can delegate that responsibility to another entity. And they did in that same section, 10 VSA 41, delegate to the Commissioner of Fish and Wildlife the authority to manage um, the Fish and Wildlife of Vermont in accordance with the requirements of the part and the rules of the Fish and Wildlife Board. That same section goes on to say that the Fish and Wildlife Board shall be the state agency charged with carrying out the purposes of this subchapter. And the subchapter is 10 VSA. Um, chapter uh, 103, subchapter 2, and it's for the regulation of regulatory powers over fish and wildlife. So effectively, what you've done in statute 10 VSA 4081 um, is you've designated the wildlife as a public trust resources. You've delegated to the commissioner the authority to manage those resources, but you delegated to the Fish and Wildlife Board authority to adopt rules to manage them, to, to provide for their, their taking. Um, and that is recognized throughout the, this chapter of law and other chapters of law. What makes these rules somewhat unique is that when the fish and wildlife regulations were first enacted, they were um, enacted as an act, an act of the General Assembly. It was written into statute. And that act said that the Fish and Wildlife Board would have authority to amend those regulations, but it also said that the General Assembly has the ability to amend those regulations directly. So that is why you see the fact that the Fish and Wildlife 
regulations are codified in statute and 10 VSA appendix because they are a shared authority by the General Assembly and the Fish and Wildlife Board. So the General Assembly as the ultimate policymaker can establish statute on any policy it is finds constitutional and that would supersede the Fish and Wildlife Board's regulations and um, the General Assembly can directly amend the Fish and Wildlife Board's regulations because those regulations were initially enacted as law and the General Assembly gave itself the authority to do so. So that's the universe of, for the Fish and Wildlife Board. They control the taking of animals and it includes hunting, seasons, method of take, um, it's for fish and game. It includes fur bearing, includes trapping. That is all authority that you have granted to the Fish and Wildlife Board already. So there is also something called the commissioner's rules where the General Assembly has granted a rulemaking authority to the department or more specifically the commissioner of Fish and Wildlife for certain areas that are outside the scope of the Fish and Wildlife Board's regulation of hunting, fishing, trapping, slash taking of fish and game. Examples of the, of the commissioner's rules are um, rules regarding the posting of property because you provided that the commissioner should set those rules and not the board. Other rules are um, uh, threatened endangered species, import of animals from out of state um, for non-hunting. Uh, those are our commissioner's rules. Um, so that they are separate from the Fish and Wildlife Board rules and they exist as traditional rules, authority that was delegated to them, to the commissioner by the General Assembly. You don't necessarily have the same type of power that you do over the commissioner's rules as you do over the Fish and Wildlife Board rules. But as the ultimate policymaker, you can say what rules the commissioner has and what he or she does not have. The issue with what I identified in S-281 is that the rulemaking grant to the commissioner is in session law. And the rulemaking grant to the, the Fish and Wildlife Board for, for the taking of, of game and wild animals, fur bearers, that's in statute. So their standalone authority overall game is there in statute. And then you have a session law provision that says the commissioner has similar, if not the same authority for the hunting of coyote with dogs. And so there, there's a potential conflict there or overlap of authority. It's very easy to fix. And there's a couple of different ways to fix that. Um, but I needed, when I was walking through myself through the bill last night, I said, oh, there's, there's an overlapping authority issue here that needs to be resolved. Okay. Can you talk about, uh, the different ways to resolve that thing? Sure. So you, one way is to use the Fish and Wildlife Board statutory authority to, to regulate the taking of fish and wildlife and just say the Fish and Wildlife Board shall adopt those rules. And then you don't have a conflict between the commissioner and the board, it's, it's the board's authority. But if, you're, if you want the commissioner to adopt those rules, I would move those rules into statute um, so that they're statute and that they would control over any rule that the Fish and Wildlife Board would enact. And then I, I would then counsel you to, to include, uh, it, it would be basically a one sentence, notwithstanding, notwithstanding the board's authority under 10 VSA 4084 or 4085, the commissioner shall establish the requirements for the taking of coyote with dogs um, and with the aid of dogs. And, and that, that I think, resolves that conflict, it'll be clear in statute that the statute controls over the board's authority. Um, I'm sorry, was that a question? No. Um, 
And then uh, I think there's kind of a hybrid approach um, where you leave it in session law, but then include some sort of notwithstanding. That's a little, little bit more muddy to me. I think your two main options are clearly give the authority to the board or clearly give the authority in statute to the commissioner and be clear that that authority controls over the board's statutory authority to adopt rules for the taking of game. Okay, thank you. Um, and either way, uh, so in draft 2.1 for instance and 1.3 last, uh, week before last, um, it laid out guidelines for what the rulemaking should address. Sometimes it said to address an issue, other times it said, here's actually what we want the rule to contain for mm -hmm. uh, of substance. Um, is that, a, does that work equally well, whether or not we're directing, uh, steering the rulemaking to the commissioner or steering the um, rulemaking to the Fish and Wildlife Board? I, I think it works. It, it it it's appropriate in both cases. As as the as the ultimate policymaker, when you delegate authority, you're supposed to provide articulable principles of what that delegation is entails. Um, setting out what you want to see in a rule is an articulable principle. And in fact, Elcar a few years ago started asking committees to be more specific about what the rules are supposed to include to provide greater articulable principles so that they know and they can review whether or not a rule meets statutory authority or legislative intent. Because it's hard to determine if a rule meets legislative intent if the only grant of rulemaking is the department shall have the authority to adopt rules under this chapter. Um, and so the, the directive is that's, and what, what the rules should address, that's really your policy authority underneath the constitution to direct what you want to see in that rule. Um, thank you for that. Um, getting the, the rules of the road street, uh, and uh, any committee questions for Mr. Brady on that part of the work? Okay. Um, the other thing, uh, I don't know what your schedule is like, Mr. Brady. If you have time to stay with us and walk through draft 2.1 of S-281. Uh, I can do that. I, I had my law clerk go to the conflicting uh, Senate committee, and so I'll be here until you're done. Okay. Um, well, thank you. So could you uh, walk us through S-281 as uh, draft 2.1, the, the most current revision? And I'll pause and just say to the um, committee and anyone watching that. So we, we had uh, a back and forth the week that we left. I agreed to work with the commissioner during our uh, town meeting week. And so I know Senator Westman and I uh, reached out to the commissioner. We had a number of meetings, talked about different ways to approach S-281. Meanwhile, I asked um, uh, Mr. O'Grady to draft another version of basically what our 1.3 draft was. It's definitely not the same uh, recommendation as what the commissioner and his staff has put together. We have that. And so we'll first I want to just look at 2.1, understand what's there, and then to hear from the commissioner on the fish and wildlife proposal, uh, what those rules might look like. And then it'll give us two documents to compare and contrast and then figure a path forward. Um, so with that, um, Mr. Grady, if you could take us through. 2.1, please. Sure. I'm going to share screen then. Okay, great. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So uh, in draft 2.1, dated uh, March 7th, 
with the timestamp of 846. The first section remains fairly similar in that you are en enacting a new section uh, in the ch chapter regarding uh, the use of dogs, um, regarding hunting coyote with the aid of dogs, the prohibitions on it and the exceptions. The first subsection provides a general prohibition that no person shall pursue coyote with the aid of dogs, either for training of dogs or for taking a coyote except as provided in subsection B and C. B is the uh, exception for a person may pursue coyote with the aid of dogs on land that they own or control in order to defend a person or property. Subsection B is the exception for a person using uh, dogs to pursue coyote on land that they do not own in order to defend a person or property. So provide, I just want to stop there. B and C both have the condition that it's only allowable for defense of a person or property and, no, and for no other reason. In C, there are conditions for the exercise of the use of dogs, the aid of dogs to pursue coyote. The first is the person who controls the dogs obtains from the person who owns or controls the land written permission to take the coyote on the land with the aid of dogs. It had previously been kind of reversed where the owner had the authority or the duty to give the, the person controlling the dog's authority. Now the person who controls the dog needs to seek um, permission. And then in sub two, a game warden needs to issue both the person who controls the land and the person who controls the dog written approval to take the coyote with the aid of dogs. And then any approval is only valid for a period of time not to exceed one week and may be reissued only once in the same year. And that same year is different. Um, so it had previously said may be reissued only once. Um, but I, I, I thought you had a conversation about adding in the same year. I may have misinterpreted that. Um, so I wanted to be clear. I put in, in the same year, but that may not have been your specific intent when talking about the permission. Yeah. Um, no doubt you have it right as drafted. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, um, then you change the penalties in subsection D. Um, that was partly because there was an automatic five-year suspension and um, potential imprisonment. Um, so instead, this is just a fine. Uh, the fine amounts are effectively the big game fine amounts. Um, without imprisonment. Um, so between a thousand max and 400 min, and then for second and subsequent, a uh, 4,000 max and a 2,000 min. Um, and then there was, should I stop? And those figures, uh, can you remind us of where those, you know, where those numbers come from? Uh, they are the fine range for a big game violation in 10 BSA. Uh, I have to find the exact um, citation. It's in the penalties and enforcement chapter for fish and game violations. Um, it's 45, um, 45, 18. So that's where those, that range of penalties comes from, range of fines. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but then uh, instead of having an automatic. Um, I'm sorry, Senator uh, uh, Weissman has a question. So under the license suspension, um, if the suspension would happen after the second violation. Well, not necessarily because that takes you down to section two. And right. this is well. This if, is, if you're going to explain it further in section two, I'm fine. I'm just trying to understand. But sure. What so so, so um, that reference to license suspension on line nine is really about if um, you are under suspension, your license has already been suspended, then no. you trigger trigger that second subsequent amount. Um, that, that ties into the uniform violator compact where 
and I, I'm get, I'm diving too deep. I'm just gonna. It just ties into the the multi-state compact about uniform violations and making sure that that states honor the suspensions of other states. And so that that's really kind of what that's about. Um, so, so it it just we presently have a point system yes. where you lose your license around you. Um, and it, as I understand it, it's a 10 point system. How does this fit with that? So that, that is what section, section two is. And it's, it's not necessarily a 10 point system. There's a, a, a range. And unfortunately I didn't put the range in the bill, but in, in 10 BSA, 4502, which is a uniform point system in subsection C, it provides the following. Licenses shall be suspended as follows. For 10 to 14 points accumulated in five years, you get a one-year suspension. For 15 to 19 points accumulated in five years, you get a two-year suspension. For a 20-point accumulation in five years, it's a three-year suspension. So what this version of the bill does is in section two assigns a 20 point violation for violating 10 BSA 5008 hunting coyote with the aid of dogs. And so that would be a three year suspension um, upon conviction. Does that Thank answer you. your question? Okay. Yeah, I, I think I get it now. Thank you. So, so what's different from this draft and the original draft is you didn't go automatically to a five-year suspension and you uh, reformed or, or revised the bill. So it, it does work within the uniform point system, but it does have a 20-point automatic assignment of points, which is a three-year suspension. So you've reduced the suspension time from five years to three years and made it fit within the uniform point system. Um, the I know you have asterisks in there for 20 points being assessed for. Um, do you know how many other 20 point uh, assessments are in that section? Um, I mean, so I'm wondering how so unusual this is. Or it's it's all letters of the alphabet, A through Z, plus A, A, B, B, and C, C. So, and there's one or two that are repealed, maybe four or five. So basically you're, you're around 22 to 23 different violations or 20 point violations. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, Moving on to section three, this is the delegation of rulemaking, the required rulemaking. This is where I would clarify if you want, if you want this to be the commissioner, you should probably put this in statute, um, a statutory directive for the commissioner to adopt these rules and then, then include a clarification of the um, authority of the commissioner to adopt these rules superseding the board's general authority to regulate the, the taking of fish and game. Uh, but right now it's just session law and it's a directive to the commissioner on or before July 1, 2023 to adopt by rule requirements for the pursuit of coyote with the aid of dogs, um, both for the training of dogs or for the taking of coyote. The rule requires a permit for the pursuit of coyote for training requires a permit for the pursuit of coyote with the aid of dogs for taking. It would require. Um, for Brady, sorry, uh, quick question on this section. So, if the is there any difference in terms of the process, like the public engagement side of things, if the rulemaking is directed to the commissioner versus to the board? Yes, yes. the The board is a is a, a um, quasi regulatory body that has to meet, uh, have a quorum um, and, in order to, and have a majority vote in order to approve a rule. The commissioner does not need to do that. The commissioner um, has to just go through the AP. And, and that, well, let me, the, the board has to do all that meet 
as a quasi-regulatory body, have a quorum, have a majority vote, and then go to APA rulemaking, whereas uh -huh. the, commis the commissioner just needs to go to APA rulemaking. Which also has a notice and uh, it has public participation uh, process. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, in addition, the rules are supposed to establish a season for the hunting of coyote with the aid of dogs. They need to require an applicant for a permit to hold a, a valid resident hunting license. They need to require the dogs used to pursue the coyote to be in control. Of the person issued the permit, and then they need to exclude the use of radio collars, telemetry, GPS collars, or similar collars that locate or track dogs as a method of complying with control requirements. Okay. Um, um, can I check in on six, please? I think there's been, I've had questions directed at me that uh, are interpreting six to mean that the use of uh, radio collars, telemetry collars, etc., is uh, disallowed, but uh, the intent, uh, my intent when I talk with you, and I think it reads this way, is that it just says that you can use such collars, but they will not constitute a method of uh, complying with any control requirement, for it, as we see under the bear hunt rules. Um, I, I, I believe that, that that was your intent. I believe it reads that way as well. I do understand how someone might read it differently. I was contemplating joining subdivision five and subdivision six so that it was clear that the exclusion was for control. Um, but I do think it is, is really only for the purpose of determining whether or not the, the permittee is in control of the dogs. If you wanna have a GPS collar on, on your land, um, you can have a GPS collar on your dog. Sure. Okay. But but it won't count won't count as control uh, underneath the law. Right, which I think we found problematic with other rules, like the bear rules before. Okay. Um, thank you. The rules also need to prohibit the use of bait. To take coyote, they need to provide the number of dogs allowed to be used for the pursuit, um, provided that they, they not exceed four dogs. Um, and they, they need to prohibit the substitution of any new dog for another dog during a hunt. They need to specify the legal method of take. And they, and they need to require the tagging and reporting of every coyote taken with the aid of dogs. So that that is the the directive rule directive to the commissioner. Again, I think it needs some, depending on what you want to do, some some revision um, to avoid that overlapping issue between the commissioner and the board. Okay. Uh, then in, in section four, um, there's uh, an implementation section. The commissioner shall not enforce the requirements of 5008, the prohibition except for defense of property until September 1, 2022. Prior to September 1, 2022, the commission provides public notice of the requirements of 5008, including posting notice on kiosks and signs of the department you know, on department lands. And then the prohibition, uh, 10 BSA 5008 and its uniform point assessment, that 20 point assessment shall be repealed on the effective date of adoption of the rules. Uh, what the, the department often does when a new rule is proposed that has a new prohibition, they will propose to the legislature in the, the department's miscellaneous bill assessment of uh, a points under the system. So it's unspoken here, but you should expect that when the rule is adopted, the department will uh, recommend new point assessments for violations of the rule. And then there's the effective date the act takes effect on passing. Um, any committee questions for Mr. O'Grady? Okay. 
So I'm going to stop sure. sharing. Uh, yes, please. Thanks. Uh, we have a question for you, Donald. I'm trying to understand what the current law is that we're that we are seeking to um, to change, um, and what what the current status is for um, hunting of coyotes with dogs. Um, do, um, do you need a license to hunt for coyotes today? You need a license to hunt game, so you need a license. Um, uh, uh, but you don't need a special permit to hunt coyote. But once you have a hunting license, then coyotes are fair game? Uh, yes. Is there a season? There's a season for the trapping of coyote. There is no season for the hunting uh, or taking up to coyote by other than trapping. So there's, you have to have a hunting license, but there's no seat. So it's a 365 day season. Um, do, do, do hunters hunting coyotes have the right to trespass on posted land? That's themselves, the, the two-legged hunters. Do they have the right to go on no on posted land, posted against hunting? Um, uh, technically, no, they do not have the right. There used to be a provision back in some of the guidance that said that they could go on to retrieve their dogs, but that, that was, that was discussed and re removed. Um, they really don't have that authority. They need to ask permission of the landowner to retrieve their dog. Is there a consequence for other than someone taking a dog to the civil court? Is there a consequence of, of trespassing um, uh, um, well, well, yes, there's, there's for a vision in, in 10 BSA 5201 um, that prohibits a person from going on land that's posted. So it's potentially a fish and wildlife violation. Then there's possibility of unlawful trespass if it triggers the criminal trespass statute. We know of any cases of people being charged with that such an offense? Uh uh yeah. Um the 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 case that I remember most specifically was the flooding of Lake Champlain and the boats um floated past the posted signs. Uh, and then they argued that they weren't trespassing or in violation of 5201 because they were on a public trust water. Uh, and the court said no, that um, the limit of their pro public trust right was the high water mark, the usual high water mark, not the flooded high water mark. And they 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 lost at the at the Supreme Court level. They so the charge of trespass was upheld at the Supreme Court level? It, it definitely 5201 was upheld. I'd have to go back and see what okay. the court said specifically about trespass. That, that wasn't coyotes, that was fishing? That, that was um, fishing, but it's also, the issue has also come up with uh, hunting waterfowl. Um, okay. the, that same concern has arose for hunting water. Um, so thank you. And so if there's a homeowner or landowner who's seeking to prohibit coyote hunters on their land um, without their, who come on the land without their permission, um, what, what must they do? Um, what's their remedy under current law? Um, I think they would need to contact a warden. They would ask the warden to investigate. They would ask the warden to either enforce or warn the person in control of the dogs to keep those dogs off the property. 
Um, and then if they don't, then I think they would probably have to seek civil recourse for trespass and damage caused by any trespass. Is there any record of hunters or of game wardens prohibiting or seeking to fine hunter, the coyote hunters with dogs that's in it's gone through the courts of any fines been instituted of any license been license has been revoked. I I am not aware of any. Um, I am not aware that doesn't mean it hasn't happened. I'm just not aware of any. So, um, just, just to share, we've had citizens who feel aggrieved um, in this area of law. And as if we're going to make any changes, I think we need to understand what is currently going on. And, um, and it's clear from the bill that we have before us that there are their citizens and from some of the testimony that there are people that feel the current practice is um, isn't I think I used I said intolerable right, a week or so ago under several circumstances that we've had brought to our attention and I'm trying to measure how the language that we have before us that would amend the bill from a simple ban tackles those grievances and what many of us believe to be um, not just unneighborly, but not, um, but in need of, we need, it need to stop. So, okay. um, so, Senator West, I think at some point we'll need to get somebody that is doing enforcement in here right. to talk about that from the enforcement level, because I um, agree with you that that's a huge problem. Uh, Michael, my question is, if you get a trespassing violation, does that affect that point system to lose your license? Um, no. The tr unlawful trespass is a crime under Title 13. The violation of 5201 is, is, is also a crime because almost all fish and wildlife violations are crime, um, but it would be a violation of 5201. The Title 13 crime doesn't trigger your points violation. You have to go and look at the point system under 4252 um, to, to look at the, the specific point allocations. Um, and unlawful trespass isn't part of that. Um, can you remind us about the, uh, the sort of the obligations of different parties? So if you don't want people, well, we'll just stick to hunting with hunting coyotes with hounds on your property uh, or hunting period, you, you have an obligation to act in terms of to post, right? Otherwise, there's a sort of a tacit assumption that the land is open to hunt. That's the default. Right. So the, the Vermont Constitution provides that the citizens of the state have the right to hunt and fowl unless otherwise enclosed by law. And enclosure has been interpreted to mean um, signage indicating that uh, hunting, fishing, or trapping is prohibited or by permission only. So the, the uh, proposal to ask, uh, to require uh, someone who's going to hunt with coyotes with hounds on a property to get written permission from the landowner, does that run afoul of, uh, well, there's an obligation to post. Uh, I'm just trying to see how the two of them do or do not fit together. So the the posting sign is you have you have options. You you can post um, a notice stating that shooting, trapping, or taking of game or wild animals is prohibited or is by permission only. 
which then would require you to get the permission of the landowner. You can say fishing or the taking of fish is prohibited. It still requires landowner or is prohibited or is by permission. Or you can say fishing, hunting, trapping, or taking of game is prohibited or is by permission. So you, you, you have some options in both, in all three cases, you can either prohibit or require permission. Okay. Down. Well, while we're on this subject, um, there are people that hunt birds with, with, uh, you know, with foul, fouling with, with, they have a, hawks or eagles that go out and grab birds and bring them back. Do we permit that in this state? There, there is a uh, regulation of falconry in the state. Falconry. Uh, falconry. You, you so, need a, a, a license to, to take game um, with the falconry license. Falconry. Uh, so we have a precedent for hunting with things other than just hounds. Um, this, uh, birds of prey under our current legal system? Uh, the, yes, falconry. Okay. Thank you. Are you thinking, may I ask, yeah, Senator Dunn, are you thinking that could be sort of a model policy? If that's there and it's somewhat similar, like you're, you know, you're hunting with another animal, is that some kind of model policy that we would follow? Well, You'd assume they would probably follow the same principles, but right, if they right. didn't, That's what they're right. probably someone would articulate a reason for them being somewhat different. It was just yeah, 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 yeah. It, yeah. There's a big is, question. It's interesting. Yeah. Hunters know the answers to the questions we're asking. We're uh, we're trying to learn. They, they they would perhaps have the most hunters would have the most useful suggestions on how to deal with this um, this issue. So, well, that, that I would think people that are doing the enforcing now would have, uh, so it would be good to get somebody from the department that's doing this. Yeah, course. yeah. Right. And I think when we, uh, Colonel uh, Bash was here, uh, yeah. here oh, yes. he also, I think, had Colonel Bash over with us. Uh, and their lawyer. And uh, Ms. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. Thank you. If we're going to change the rules, we ought to understand the rules that are in existence yeah. before we start changing stuff and, and copy what has yeah. worked in the past the really rather good. than um, if it has indeed worked in the past. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Sid. Thank you. Um, one quick last question. Is there any way in which it would uh, arguably uh, an unfair additional burden on a hunter to require written permission uh, to, uh, you know, take coyotes with hounds on a property, you know, because someone could say, well, once it's posted, that's that. But we've heard um, from members of the department in prior years that hounds don't read and that therefore, um, you know, it, so what we're, the point of some of the provisions in 2.1 are to make it uh, that it becomes an explicit permission and you therefore you're not counting on quote unquote that hounds can't read, which I think isn't a particularly helpful answer on why the trespass occurs. So, so again, back the question was, is it an unfair bird to ask for written permission uh, from someone who wants to hunt coyotes with hounds on a property? Um, well, I don't know of any provision that says written permission. I know of several that say landowner permission. Um, for example, the use of tree stands or ground blinds on property that's not your own, <coughs> you need the landowner's permission. Um, I don't, I don't know if I can't recall any that says written. I can look into that further if you would like. Okay. Uh, yes, please. I mean, I think the, the reason I ask is because if we're going to get into a regulatory system, 
one of the yeah. things that's difficult from talking yeah. to people who have struggled with the whole <laughs> issue is that the hounds and hunters may have moved on by the time a warden can arrive on scene. So then establishing the facts of the case are it's more difficult. And that by having a written record, at least it uh, helps establish the facts of the relationship um, in a tangible way that makes regular regulation, I think, more simple and direct. That that was the goal. But anyway, okay. um, I'm, I'm just I'm just finding landowner permission, or and there's one where it has to be advanced permission, but it's not specifically written. Okay. So, um, and Senator McCormick uh, has a question for you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I apologize for being on Zoom. I've had eye surgery and I'm laying low. Um, so I don't know what that means. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I want to just sort of to establish the, the context in which I'm, I'm asking my question, which I will get to. Um, opponents of the bill as introduced, um, one of their complaints was that we were um, rushing, which um, in behalf of the committee, I, I, I plead not guilty. I don't think we were rushing at all. We've given the bill a lot of time. We've heard from all sides, um, uh, but one of the complaints is, is that we were rushing. I'm wondering now in the last week before crossover, we suddenly have a lot of new language in front of us. And I don't want to, having, having been innocent of that charge, I don't want to suddenly become guilty of it. Um, I am reluctant to rush through. There, there's a lot, of, a lot more detail in this than in the bill as introduced. The, 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 one of the complaints of the opponents was that we were playing scientist when we're not scientists and we should leave this to the, to the experts. And my answer on that was that, that we were not asking a scientific question. The, for me, the question was simply that, that surrounding an animal with a pack of dogs uh, nipping at him is, is unnecessarily cruel. And it was a matter of cruelty. It was an ethical issue more than a scientific issue. But now we're, got, we're getting into some details uh, I was under the impression that what we were going to do was sort of hand this off to the commissioner and ask the commissioner to develop the policy in detail. The idea that we would be deferring to the commissioner's expertise. But I'm, I would like to, and now my question, which is I would like, uh, Michael, if you would um, just point out to me how directive are the instructions to the commissioner. Uh, it, sounds, it looks to me like, like we're telling him not just to look into certain things and get back to us. We're telling him sort of what the results should be. And uh, if that's the case, I don't know if we've done enough of the research of the science. But can you just point out how, how directive is this to make the question shorter? It's a, it's a fairly... Yeah. Specific, specific grant of rulemaking. It's yeah. the 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 requirements are are pretty specific. Number of dogs. What can be used for determining control? Um, it's it's pretty specific. That doesn't that doesn't mean that it's unconstitutional or, or erroneous or arbitrary, but it's. It's specific. Uh, yeah, Mr. Mr. Chairman, my, you know, my sense is sometimes the big pictures are the big picture is easier to analyze than than the minutia. Uh, you can. I, I was fairly comfortable just saying, well, I, I think this is unnecessarily cruel. It's unethical. We should stop it. When you start getting into all the specific details, I don't know if I feel confident I, well, so comment sorry, one sorry. way or another on this. It's a, uh, thanks for the observation. And it's a you know, fair question for sure. And I think that's probably a good segue for
from the draft 2.1 to the commissioner also has a draft that we have access to. And, and, um, and then I was saying, you know, that in the end, uh, there's many, the topics are similar. The, the approaches to coming up with an answer are, are different. So, uh, Senator Westman. I, I just say from what we've just been through and the issue of trespass, yeah. I find it perplexing a little to myself. And I'm saying this so the commissioner can hear in the people that do enforcement that we send um, uh, a game warden out to enforce the law of the hunting and fishing laws. But if there's trespassing on property, they have no way to assess points. It appears in this against the hunting and fishing license, which is in their bailiwick. I, I, so in the process, when you get, get to that point, it, I'm, I am interested in that question, why there is no connection there. Right, it's like having a, a Phillips head screwdriver when you need a slotted or the other way around. Well, I, 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 you know, it's the game warden that's enforcing the hunting and fishing laws, and then somebody goes on and they trespass, and it's a whole different body, it, you know, right. it seems not connected. Okay, great. Um, Mr. O'Grady, anything you want to, uh, we touched on a bunch of different things. Thanks for your help. I don't know if there's anything you want to say based on hearing us talk about this. I, I just found two provisions in the rules that require written permission. It's the use of tree stands outside the time period of, um, outside the time period from the third Sunday in August through the third Saturday in December and from May 1 through May 31st. Uh, after that, you need written permission from the department in order to put up a tree stand. It kind of makes sense because you'd be outside of hunting season. Um, and then the, or traditional big game hunting. Um, and then you need certain written permission prior to setting traps for uh, cottontail and snowshoe uh, from the owner of the property or the prop where the trap is to be set. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and so let me just double check what Senator Westman's pointing out. If it's a, if it's a warden, uh, we've lost Mr. Brady. All right. So with that, the last plus go where I... I'm, I'm so, here. I just thought you were done with me. Oh, no, that... So what Senator Westman's pointing out, uh, that a warden can give a fish and wildlife violation, but for trespass, but no points are connected to that action? Is that, I, I just want to get it, say it correct. It's a different section of law, yeah. Right, it's, it's when, first of all, to my knowledge, all the wardens are, are full, full enforcement officers, which mean they have the ability to enforce all laws of the state, criminal and otherwise. Um, including local. Uh, there are two different laws, two different crimes. One is a Title 10 fish and wildlife violation. And that's violating the requirements of 10 BSA 5201 and entering the property of someone who's posted that property again against hunting, fishing, or trapping, or by permission only. That's, that's a violation, potential violation. There's also a Title 13 violation for unlawful trespass. Um, and the, the warden has the ability to um, cite a person for either. However, under the points assessment, points are only assessed for the violation of 5201 or some other fish and wildlife violation that is listed either specifically under the points assessment or is listed under the part, the 10 BSA part four, um, which is where fish and wildlife violations are. So it's, there, there are a lot of crimes that have overlapping 
activity, but different penalties for the different crimes. When you, you have one here, um, the same activity could result in this two different crimes, but there's different penalties for each. Okay, thanks. So in, in essence, if you were cited under Title 13 by a warden, you would, uh, unless he or she also cites you under 5201, there'll be no points against your license. Right, and vice versa. If you're cited under Title 10, but not Title 13, you don't have the possibility of imprisonment and that you do under Title 13. Okay. Thanks for that further clarification. All right. I'll do that. Um, Mr. Commissioner, thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, feel free to bring on to the screen with you any of your colleagues that you'd like to have participate. Um, good morning, Colonel Batchelder. Um, so uh, you have a, a thanks that you, you and your team worked on a draft of what the, uh, the bill might look like in order to do rulemaking and another, well, I, let me just stop there. You have another proposal. So I'd like to lay them out side by side, but we don't understand yours yet. So let's walk through your proposal and do that however you like. Thank you and uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and committee. Just for the record, I'm Christopher Herrick, the commissioner of the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And today with me, and I'll have them introduce themselves and go on to record now, uh, Colonel. Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee. Colonel Jason Batchelder, I'm the director of enforcement for the Division of Warden Service, Department of Fish and Wildlife. Thanks for having me. Catherine. Good morning, my name is Catherine Guessing. I am general counsel for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. So, so um, I think it's important. Um, yes, we do have a, a draft that we've worked hard on and <laughs> we'll discuss, but I would like to react briefly to uh, the bill that's on the table and I, I I was um, I, I agree with Senator McCormick's assessment in that what we're talking about is significant uh, and detailed and requires a great deal of thought. Um, the other piece, and I'll get into it a little more, is I do believe that in the version that was just presented, the rulemaking is extremely prescriptive. And I also am very concerned as the commissioner that the process you're considering is bypassing the Fish and Wildlife Board. And I would warn that is a very bad precedent um, that I think it, it creates problems down the road where if we don't wanna go through the process of the board, uh, we might just try to bypass it. I will mention that the board has to vote on it, whatever rule, three times. And there are many, many public meetings are required to get there in the development of the rule. Um, and so I, I think I, I would be very careful about moving in that direction. Um, and before I get into, uh, well, I'll just get into our bill. Do you happen to have it that you can post? Uh, I don't have a copy of it. He didn't send it. He didn't send it to me. Yeah, I think we all have hard copies in the room, but okay. He can screen share. Uh, if you, if uh, I can try. A code, a code let me, so at least theoretically, you can screen share it. Let me see if I can screen share it. Uh, is this one? No. Hang on. I believe that's it. Here we go. So, um, here in, I'm just, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'll paraphrase. Uh, we would, 
um, look to restrict the number of such permits issued in a year um, to 100 um, and the number of uh, non-residents being limited to only 10%. And um, there are, I have the ability as a commissioner to restrict how non-residents are able to receive permits. The one thing I, I would say is that's included because we have uh, reciprocity regarding hunting rules and regulations uh, with other states. And we, we wouldn't want to get into starting to violate that um, and uh, having other states not recognizing our hunting licenses and so on and so forth. The other part is the permitting uh, would come from the legislature. That is um, more in line with the typical process for permitting and the fees there um, are uh, typical for this kind of um, permit. Uh, we look at the next section too, um, and this is where we get into landowner. Uh, no person shall release any dog for the purpose of hunting onto land. If the landowner or landowner's agent has previously personally communicated to the dog owner or dog handler. Um, and as we read these, the second one, no person shall release a dog um, on posted property and then it's prohibiting the dog if they've been told previously or, and so this would uh, require communication with the game warden, but we encourage that. Um, not for the game warden to have to issue written permits, which is creating a ton more work, um, but just so that they're involved um, and they probably, and I'll look to the Colonel to at least nod on this, they probably know who these people are already. Is that a fair statement? Um, in terms of the hunters. When you get to penalties, the first offense uh, as a person violating this section shall commit a minor fish and wildlife violation and be subject to penalties under um, 10 VSA. And then um, the person violating the second um, is a fine not greater than a thousand. Um, I think when you look at um, 20 points for a violation, um, we're talking about taking like endangered species um, or poaching um, big game out of season. Um, and so uh, I think we wanna be careful that we're not elevating um, things out of the normal scale. Um, so here's the moratorium language. Um, uh, and we have a question from Senator Weston, please. Can you just back it up? Um, so in the 10 VSA, the penalties that are there, would that allow a game warden to assess points? So I'm gonna turn this discussion over to the Colonel. Thanks for the question, Senator Westman. As it's written in number one, penalties, first offense, first violating this section shall have committed a minor fish and wildlife violation. It will be subject to penalties provided under 4572. This is our civil or minor fish and wildlife violation section in Title 10. It covers um, almost exclusively um, licensing and biological data collection penalties. This would be something that would loosely fit in there, but we've done it in, in areas before. But what this does, uh, it does a couple of things. It'll, it, yes, to answer your question, it, it could allow for penalties to be assessed in a, in a points arena. It also allows for wardens to act as their, as their own uh, prosecutors, because these minor fish and wildlife violations are largely uh, civil and they're handled in the Judicial Bureau. So that it allows wardens to act as their own prosecutor, but um, I believe there are seven violations listed in 4572. Six of them carry points. So yes, and, and certainly we would have discussions about whether or not these should have points. It sounds like that's what you want. Okay, thank you. Okay, so yeah, we would consider uh, that as an uh, addition. Um, so under moratorium, um, 
Yeah, I think you've read it, but um, no, a person may use dogs to hunt in defense of property provided the person is a landowner or has expressed permission of the landowner. A person may use dogs to pursue coyote on land that they own or um, use dogs to pursue them on land they do not own or control provided the person who owns and controls the land uh, provides the person who controls them with permission um, with the use of dogs. Um, and then the moratorium would sunset upon the adoption of the rules uh, in section four. The section four, the, here are the rules. They're similar to what we've seen, but the difference being the Fish and Wildlife Board, not the commissioner, um, will adopt, shall adopt rules regarding the hunting of, of coyote with the aid of dogs with at least the following provisions. There could be more. A limit on the number of dogs, but in your language, the previous language, it indicates the limit is four. Not sure where that comes from. And if we're going to do regulation like that, you may as well put it in the statute and not have it be a regulation. Um, prohibit the substitution or relaying of dogs, uh, specify the legal method of takes, such as rifle, muzzle loader, crossbow, so on and so forth, uh, and require every coyote taken uh, with the aid of the dog uh, be reported. And the board shall also consider whether to include provisions related to seasonal restrictions, baiting reasonable control of the dogs in the rule. I, I will say this, the, the language regarding GPS and collars is confusing and could lead to misinterpretation. And those collars also can be used to control dogs. Um, uh, if you bird hunted uh, over a dog, uh, oftentimes if the dog is heading in the wrong direction, you can use the collar to bring them back. Uh, so, that is the bill that we've been working on and communicated with uh, a number of folks on the committee and think it is a reasonable approach. Um, and then uh, it will, what it does is it allows us to get a sense of who's out there doing it on paper because we'll have requiring permits. Um, it'll uh, give us some teeth which we can enhance uh, as the Colonel discussed and um, we can look at all the ad additional issues, but what it doesn't do is over prescribe the rulemaking and it doesn't uh, disregard the value and purpose of the Fish and Wildlife Board as the other bill um, does in my opinion. So with that, I can uh, respond to any questions. Okay, thank you for, for that. Um, well, as the uh, uh, sponsor of the amendment, uh, I think the the original direction of the rulemaking to the to, to the commissioner's office was uh, centered around the notion of uh, having a more direct process. I don't, uh, but it's uh, you know it's certainly. And then Mr. Brady pointed out how that's contrary to uh, create some conflict that needs amendment either way. So I don't want to. Thanks for pointing out that and open to reconsidering that, that piece of it. I did want to check in in section two about a landowner has previously personally communicated to the dog owner or dog handler. The, the challenge I can imagine with that is that there are people who release towns miles away from the property where the dogs end up, let's just call it trespassing, right? Like that's posted or the person doesn't want them there. So I'm not sure, practically speaking, that many there are many people that could have hounds coming into their property uh, that won't have seen the hunters at all. They could have started you know, a mile away or seven miles away. I think reading someone's account of coyote in Vermont, and it was a 15 mile chase. So uh, I'm a little concerned that having that be a burden of the landowner, they don't even know the hounds are coming. How are they supposed to find the, the dog owner or handler to tell them this ahead of time? 
I'm not sure I under, are they even there? Um, and so, and I'm not trying to be evasive, but how do they even know the dogs came on their property? It's, well, for instance, people who had uh, hounds in and around their house, either with coyotes present and sheltering around the house or passing through like a barn, uh, horse uh, paddock, stuff like that, and uh, frightening other livestock on the farm. So the, the hounds come through, but the hunters may never appear. So I'm just trying to figure out how does that person? So I would suggest, um, because this is new, uh, I would suggest one that that would, um, you know, call the call the wardens, and they can come out and investigate. And um, I know this is, uh, you know, in a given area, the warden in the area probably knows who the hunters are, and can communicate with them, and uh, say, hey, look you know, following this, you're not allowed on this property. They've asked that this not go on and forth. And we would keep a record of that. Um, I know it's, um, it may seem hard to believe in this day and age, but uh, our game wardens who, by the way, are in fact um, sworn law enforcement, they um, may have seen recently they were involved. Uh, not only were they investigating a poaching, of um, deer, but they also came across a large amount of firearms, fentanyl, and other opioids, and were part of that um, and made those arrests. Uh, so they are um, really what I would say the definition of community policing. Um, I know that I've had game wardens in my deer camp prior to my becoming um, commissioner and they know uh, the lay of the land and will be able to work with landowners um, um, to info help enforce this. Uh, Colonel, do you wanna to add to that? Thanks, Commissioner. Um, in, in simple terms, um, the wardens do know almost to, um, to a finite um, uh, certainty, the amount of coyote hounds that are in their district. The wardens are required by me to be infinite or to be intimately familiar with their district. And if someone has a pack of hounds um, within a geographic area where the wardens are required to live, then the warden knows those dogs. They know the hound hunter. If a pack of dogs runs through uh, someone's land, 99 times out of 100, the warden's going to know exactly who they belong to. I feel like this is a, an easy, easily enforceable section. If someone um, called the warden and said, hey, five coyote hounds just ran across my yard. I don't ever want them here again. Um, the warden would certainly know uh, where to start and where to finish. I will also tell you that the majority of this happens during um, times of snow. The, the coyote hunters don't like to run when there's no snow on the ground for a lot of reasons. And um, it doesn't take a game warden to track a pack of five hounds through the snow. It's, it's, it's something they do a lot. So that, that's an easy one, I feel. Okay. Um, are there any current provisions in law that would allow a game warden today to enforce against uh, a hunter who sent hounds through uh, someone's property, posted property, like the Title 13 provisions? I'm just wondering if it's... If we're not, so what do, do you sure. not have any mechanism to enforce now? I, I don't believe there is. There, there are wardens who would argue that, um, Mr. Chair. Um, if, a, if a person were found to have intentionally sent hunting dogs onto properly posted property, there are wardens who argue they can meet the elements of the offense. Uh, I'm just not prepared to, to speak for a prosecuting attorney on, on that, and maybe Miss Guessing could, but... Um, large, largely no, and, and by practice, we don't um, feel, I don't feel as the director, we have the ability to enforce against that. Certainly, if, if the hunter, his or herself, 
or him or herself were to go on the land, we certainly do. And we have the ability to arrest and to affect points on that person signing license. Um, the other part is, yeah, please go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. The other part is tricky. That's all I'll say. Okay. Um, so currently when you get, uh, I, from different stories we heard, people would, did call the warden and can you say what was the result of calling the warden currently? I mean, do you have, any, I'll just stop there. Sure. Um, wardens spend a, a great deal of time in the area of, of popular hound hunting um, properties. Uh, Franklin County, for instance, has a lot of ag agricultural land. Addison County has a lot of agricultural land. Um, hound hunters like to see their hounds, and so they like to be out in, in open areas where this occurs. So, so wardens routinely, I, I, this past weekend, wardens were out um, in those areas. And so if a, if a landowner calls, wardens will respond and they will discuss the situation, which, you know, as, as you, you are aware, there, there are regulations and laws that pertain, but they not specifically to permitting the activity of, of coyote hound hunting. People still need to have a hunting license. They still need to have methods appropriately for the weapons that they're using. They still can't be within 25 feet of a public highway to shoot. Um, so it's not as simple as there are no rules. There are there are rules, but um, most of the coyote hound hunters follow them, and and so when the the dogs you know run across land, that becomes the issue. So to answer your, spe your question specifically, the wardens respond and they play um, they play a very good mediating role um, with with these um, with these people who are are you know aggrieved by some of this activity. Um, then, and I won't, I won't hide behind the fact that there's frustration on both sides, that there are, are one or two bad actors that could, that could use, um, some regulation, but, um, I honestly don't feel like there are much more than that. I, I know Miss Guessing had her hand up as well. Um, but we do respond to these Senator and we do, um, spend a, a great deal of time making sure that these, um, activities are regulated to the best of the ability, which we have. Thank, uh, thank you, Senator, Senator McDonald and Senator Campion. Um, I'm trying to understand the difference between what happens when someone calls a local uh, animal control officer that there's an unleashed dog on their property and the animal control officer comes to their property and takes the dog and locks it up and then they negotiate or deal with the fact that it wasn't on a leash and it wasn't on a chain. Um, to, to compare that to the number of times that game wardens have impounded dogs that were on, out on posted land and how many times such dogs have been collected and been held until the owner arrives to um, do whatever the process is. How many documented times have wardens in the course of their duty collected and dogs that are trespassing um, on private property when landowners have called and asked for actions, action? Well, I, I think that number is very difficult to know. Um, if, if you'd like me to simply say that the dogs aren't trespassing, I'm, I'm willing to do that, right? The hunter is the trespasser, and the the hound is is could not trespassing by our statute. Could and you so, direct us to someone who could give us those numbers if you don't have them? Where where would those numbers be kept, and how could the members of this committee and the public evaluate whether or not this is a real problem? Sure, um, Senator, I can get you the numbers of how many times a warden has confiscated or impounded a dog. I, I will get that to you uh, as soon as I get off the call. Um, as far as animal control, I simply do not know where or if those numbers are kept. Um, but I will tell you as well that the number may not be satisfying because if a hound ran across my posted land, it's, it's certainly not, it's not a violation. And I don't record instances 
all the time that are not violations simply because they occurred. So I'm, I'm Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm trying to understand that when a dog is not on a leash as the law calls for, and hounds are not on leashes, um, how does a, a dog get, a dog that's a hound is exempt from the leash laws, just? I believe leash laws are town ordinances. Even when it's trespassing on property I, that has said no hunting on it, it's exempt from leash laws and? If I may, I believe, I believe, Leash laws are local ordinances and not all towns have them. Um, okay, and then we can't see, we only see one speaker. Yeah, that was gonna be my comment, if oh, I may. Yeah. It's just- If you I, stop screen sharing. Okay, yeah, it's- uh, Okay, I can do that. All the witnesses at the same time, so we, oh, there we go, okay. Great, thanks. Oh, Mr. Chair, we have a bill before us that is rather draconian to ban hunting with hounds. And it's here because the Fish and Wildlife Board has chosen, has yet to take this up and try and resolve it. And the Fish and Wildlife Board, like board I believe, has more experience in this than we do, but it appears that they have taken no actions on these issues. Um, and I don't know how to we account for that, but there seems to be a disparity between some dogs that are on property that's posted and how those dogs are treated and other dogs that are on that property um, equally um, without local authority, that there seems to be some unequal treatment. And the public is probably asking, why is that so? And how might it be remedied? If I might, Senator. Um, yes, you're right. Uh, the board hasn't, uh, this, to this point, taken action. I can't say why, um, but here we are, and I do believe it is time. It may be because um, it's not an excuse, but it may be that the number of hound hunters is a small number, um, especially hound hunters of coyotes. And so that may be, but that being said, uh, it is time to take a look. Uh, and that's why, um, you know, I have the Colonel here, I have uh, Catherine here, and we're presenting a bill which we believe reasonably allows to make a step in that direction. Um, Senator Campion, did you have something you want to follow up? Uh, no, thank you. Okay, Senator Westman. So um, let me ask, um, you have on your website, and, and as a landowner, I've um, granted permission um, um, with this. You have the courtesy cards and the whole process of posting and explaining posting on the website and the courtesy cards. How extensively are the courtesy cards used? And um, how would we, in this case, encourage more um, um, hunters to use the courtesy card. And since um, coyote hunting with dogs seems to have been raised up in a level around that, is there a way that we can um, um, push more coyote hunters into using a, a courtesy card? I don't know the answer to the to your question in terms of how what the utilization is like. Um, I think it's hard to know. But what I, I can tell you is that 
um, the folks that I know and hunt with and what our hunter education programs talk about is working with your neighbors who um, and the land you may hunt on. And there are various ways to do that. Um, excuse me. Hang on. Um, and I think we, with our education programs, would, would definitely encourage that for all hunters as we continue to do, uh, and maybe working with folks um, who it would benefit them even more if they use them. Um, and that's, that again is a conversation that the wardens can have uh, with folks. Um, but it is a message that we, we clearly at the department encourage um, I can say from personal experience with the, with the land I hunt on, um, that's not mine. I give the landowners gift baskets um, uh, every year in the fall. It's a thank you. And um, so I think it, it's an effort that regardless of whether this bill passes or any other bill or any modification of it, it's something that the department can work on um, trying to encourage. Um, Miss, uh, uh, Miss Guessing, you had your hand up, but we couldn't see it earlier. I don't know if that means you have a, something you'd like to share with the committee still, or if that was 10 minutes ago and it's <laughs> water over the dam. Well, I, I do have a couple of comments. Um, I think as a practical matter, the town enforcement of leash laws is um, somewhat inconsistent depending on their resources and how remote um, you know, the property is where the incidents happen. Certainly town um, dog catchers have impoundment um, authority you know, by statute under Title 24. Um, and then I also think that as a practical matter, hounds are often sort of, you know, gone before a dog catcher gets there. Um, and that may be the case for um, wardens, but wardens certainly have the ability to track people and they have the sort of local knowledge of who's hunting. Um, and I also did want to say that, you know, this proposal is... Um, really the first, um, it would be the first time that the department has had explicit authority to ticket people for um, the unwanted presence of dogs on somebody's land. And it does, it's also um, allows us to impose points on people's licenses. So under 52, 10 BSA 5502, any um, violation that is not a catch-all violation and is not exempt from points, which would be the first violation under section um, two, results in five points on your license. And then the way that this is written is that the second um, and subsequent violations would result in 10 points on your license. And um, that, that section, section two, uh, section two, two B, um, should, should be, I think 4502 B2, it just says two in parentheses, but B2 is the, um, 10 point section. And 10 points is loss of license for how long, please? That's for a year. Um, we do find oftentimes if there's one violation, there's more than one violation. <laughs> and so um, I think the Colonel can speak to this better than I can, but sometimes um, points accumulate faster than a year. It's the point system is sort of set up so that if you have 10 to 14, your, um, your License revocation or suspension is one year. If you have 15 to 19 points, it's two years. And then when it's 20 plus, you're getting up to three years. So it's sort of a graduated process of um, points and um, 
suspension periods. Thank you. Well, any, any questions for Ms. Ms. Yes. Um, all right, well, Senator Bray, if I might, I had one addition to sure. Senator McDonald's question regarding why have the board may not have taken action on this. The board um, deals with many issues on a regular basis. And a lot of those are petitions and this just hasn't come to the board as well. And so there is that aspect of it as well. So the Fish and Wildlife Board hasn't been petitioned to create laws around right. hunting coyotes with dogs. Okay, Senator Campy. Uh, Commissioner, so uh, that kind of petition, is that, is there, a, what's that process? Is there a form online or is it email? Can you say, or I think Ms. Guessing is going to save you on this one. Uh, yeah, she's, she's the expert on that. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Ms. Guessing, thank you. So um, under the Vermont APA statute, which is in Title Three, all that is required is one person to petition a, a, a board or an agency to um, promulgate rules. And um, the board or the agency must respond to that petition within 30 days and indicate whether they've made a decision on um, how they're gonna handle the petition. Um, with the board, because the board doesn't always meet within 30 days, essentially what we do is we acknowledge the petition and we advise the petitioner when we're gonna take it up. We give um, the petitioner an opportunity to present to the board. And then oftentimes, depending on how complicated the issues are, we, um, the board will direct the department to come back to the board with um, a proposal. Um, some petitions are very um, simple and can be handled pretty quickly. Some are a lot more complicated just because, for example, our fishing rules are quite um, intricate in, you know, there's different rules for different water bodies and so it can be um, a little more complicated. So, so Ms. Gesson, just so I'm clear, is it, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna, is it an email? Is it a, is it a letter? It, can, it, it, we generally require something in writing. Sometimes somebody calls us and we say, you know, can you please just put it in writing so we, we can really understand exactly what you, uh, what you want here. Sure. Um, so it, can, it can be an email, it can be a letter. Yeah. So um, where on the website would a Vermonter find this information? That's, you know, so maybe that's, because maybe there's part of what we're kind of figuring out here is, is maybe there are people that just, you know, don't know how to, don't know it's possible, that kind of thing. Is there somewhere on the website? Well, we do have a board website. We also have a fish and wildlife email where people make no, inquiries. Is there something about being able to petition? Is there anywhere that says, if you have a concern around X, Y, Z, as a citizen of Vermont, you are allowed to petition? Oh, I'm not really sure. I, I don't okay. think so. I don't think okay. so. Okay, if you wouldn't but mind we, checking on that, that would be great. I appreciate sure, it. Sure, sure. And it's certainly something that we could put on the board website. Um, that'd be great, that'd be huge. That's, that'd be huge. An, that's an easy lift. Yep, that's an easy lift. That. Okay. Um, Commissioner, you, when we first talked about this bill, um, feels like a very long time ago to me, but there, you had said that there are some folks that regard, unfortunately regard coyotes as, uh, and I don't think, I don't think you actually said it this way, but something like vermin, rats, et cetera, you know, not, okay. not <laughs> treated with respect the way that most wildlife would be treated and i'm wondering to what degree is that a uh, problem and how might this uh for moving a bill forward is there a way to address that sort of public uh outreach and what people know about the value of coyotes as part of our integrated you know 
system out there, all sorts of animals in relationship with one another. Yeah, let me be clear. I wasn't saying that I believe that. Um, and no, by the way, that. there are some people, if you go down to Connecticut, they feel the same way about the white-tailed deer um, for what that's worth. Um, what I can say is the Fish and Wildlife Department uh, has an inc incredibly good outreach program. And um, if I said to them, hey, let's talk about how we communicate the value of all the various wildlife uh, and their role in natural communities and the ecosystems, um, that's something they can do. Um, they do it already. I don't think they focused on the coyote, but um, I think, um, you know, having that as a, a, an outlet, you know, we have a number of different ways we reach out to the community. Um, but, you know, I, I can only, you can only do so much, but we can try. That's, you know, that's not a bad, not a bad idea. I can talk with them about that. Okay. Um, I see your team has both hands up there. So uh, I think Colonel I probably Russell, said something they don't like. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Colonel. I just wanted to elaborate on what the commissioner was, was getting at. Um, Kim Royer, our fur bear project leader, has um, has compiled an incredible study on coyotes. Very, very pro coyote leaning and has sung that song to his, anyone who would listen all around the state. I'm sure her presentation is recorded and I'm sure she'd be glad to give you an expurgated version of it anytime you'd like. Um, uh, I think it's, I think it's extraordinary. Uh, and I send it to everyone who, who shows any interest in coyotes. So if you'd like that, we can provide it to you. Sure. If, if you could email uh, either if it's a link or whatever it is to <coughs> our committee assistant, Ms. Newman, that would be great. Thanks so much. Um, Ms. Guessing. Sorry, I do believe that some of that information was sent to the committee in response to a question from um, POW where you were also CC'd. Um, there was a presentation to Across the Fence um, and there was also a presentation that was done to members of the public. And really one of the things that we've been trying to do is to focus on hunters. Um, I do think that it's unfair to um, assert that we have not, or that Kim Royer has not engaged in these efforts. She certainly has, and she's been doing so for years. And if you look at our website, there's some really great information about coyotes and you know, their value to the ecosystem and um, you know, how, you know, how they, they have um, taken the kind of place of other predators that um, are no longer here. So um, there's an email that was sent out on March 4th, which talks about some of the efforts that the ongoing efforts that the department has made in the last decades um, to you know, try to change public attitudes about coyotes. Awesome, well, thank you. And would who, from whom did that email come just so I can look more clearly for it? Kim Royer. It came from Kim Royer. Okay, thank you. Um, and so I'm glad you spoke up. I didn't mean to imply that there was uh, you know, an insufficient effort. I just thought based on the commissioner talking about some people's attitudes that maybe you know we could use more, but... Um, Obviously, I'm not aware of all the efforts going on at the department, so I just was sharing that as part of thinking about what could be addressed in this discussion and or bill. Uh, Senator McDonald. Mr. Chair, this, the issue here is not about coyotes. We wouldn't, that's not what the bill before us deals with. It deals with dogs, um, private property, trespassing, and the behavior of dogs when they're trespassing on private property, um, chasing coyotes or hounding coyotes. And I'm, I don't know why we on this committee are being asked to resolve this problem. Um, we have a fish and wildlife board 
that keeps its pulse on what's going on in the state having to do with animals, coyotes. That, there are plenty of studies about coyotes and what they're, how they behave, what they do, um, how they might or might not be managed. And that's the Fish and Wildlife like Board's responsibility. That's not, that's why we have one. And I, I don't know why we're sitting here with a bill to ban coyote hunting. And when we ask, well, what's the Fish and Wildlife Board done to provide the leadership they're created for, to make <laughs> suggestions that they meet to discuss. And we're told there are no recommendations. Um, no one's petitioned the Fish and Wildlife Board. We have a, another bill before us to change the Fish and Wildlife Board to put a more diverse group of people to discuss the issues that you tell us today, the Fish and Wildlife Board hasn't discussed because no one has brought it to their attention. Um, we're not even second fiddle on this one, we're third fiddle and we're getting all the phone calls. We're getting phone calls about stuff that the Fish and Wildlife Board hasn't had brought to them, hasn't been brought to their intention, it hasn't been petitioned before the Fish and Wildlife Board. This is, and I, Commissioner, you were in a, unfairly sitting there having to take this because you just arrived on the job. And, but why is this on our desk when we have a board that's supposed to make recommendations, when we have reports about coyote behavior, why are we given a bill to abolish uh, coyote hunting? Where are the steps that the board is supposed to deal with to make recommendations to us? So that's a, a long speech for those of us that have been locked up for two years from COVID, and, um, <laughs> which has probably hampered the, the board's work also. But it should not come to this um, hunters and fishermen know how to deal with this problem a heck of a lot better than legislators. And yet it's stumped in our, our lap here today in a rather extreme way of simply banning stuff, which I don't think the committee wants to ban totally, but they would certainly like to have some recommendations from the department on how to deal with the problem of trespass and neighbors and 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 hunters and citizens interacting with each other in ways that are unproductive and disrespectful. And this is, uh, we shouldn't be here doing this. So I whined and complain. And, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you'll have another one soon. <laughs> I but I like what he's saying. Now that he's, now that he's out of COVID, <laughs> he's got this extra energy. Right, you want a petition. Uh, fish and wildlife work. Um, so uh, before we, Senator McDonald mentioned uh, the composition of the board and it's 1130, which was on our schedule to pivot to S129. I did want to uh, share you on know, one comment based on the last 10 days since we were in committee. And I think I have over a thousand emails. I'm guessing committee members are probably in the same boat we've heard that's why you missed Kim's um, email. Yeah, it could, <laughs> could be. The, uh, Tim, okay. yeah, Kim. Oh, Kim. Screens full of lists of emails. Uh, but I've really given it a lot of thought. And so one thing I would like, so I appreciate you coming back with a proposal. We have two, but I'd like to find a way to move forward drawing on what the thinking of this committee plus the expertise of the department and exactly what that means, I don't know, but I wanted to say two things that really I clarified to try to help steer through this sort of swamp of conflicting points of view. And that is one that we should be guided by science in the end, right? I mean, that's a, a familiar thing to this committee. We always say, what's the science tell us? And the other one is, um, I do think more there is, uh, do you have another one? This could, this could be a very divisive issue and uh, in a time where we're already 
suffering from a lot of different forms of division. And I Thank think you. I would like to see us craft a solution that demonstrates tolerance from both sides towards the activities and views of others who take, uh, you know, come to different conclusions. Because I think tolerance is worth fostering and preserving in and of itself, as well as working on the bill. So mm -hmm. wanted to, to share that. Um, and so let's go to S129. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Might, might I have a minute before we go? Before we oh, shift sure. focus. We didn't, Thank we you. Didn't, uh, we didn't see yeah. you. I think we all we all agree about the uh, the virtue. Um, we all agree about the virtue of tolerance. Uh, the question often though is, how tolerant must we be towards intolerance? There's not a, a middle ground is not always desirable. I think there comes a time when you use the plumbing facility for its intended purpose, or you get off it, and the proposition underlying the bill as introduced is that um, hounding of coyotes is unacceptably uh, cruel. And uh, the idea that uh, nature is cruel, yes, it is. Nature is cruel. However, over for over a century, we have understood the gratuitous cruelty to animals is unacceptable. Uh, cruelty to animals has been illegal longer than cruelty to children has been illegal and it is a proper function of the state. So uh, I think oversimplifying is something that legislators ought to avoid, but there is such a thing as overcomplicating. Some things are simple. And I think the question before us is, is the hounding of coyotes an acceptable level of cruelty or is it not? And I think we're monkeying around uh, trying to avoid confronting that question. The, the bill presented to us that challenge. Is this acceptable or is it not? And I don't think it's a scientific question. It is a moral question. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to turn to the what is the other two bills, uh, and that's S-129 on the organization and governance model for the board, which is Senator Campion's bill, and uh, wanted to continue our discussion there and see, so because Campion, uh, Senator Campion has been leading on this, I would like to uh, ask him to sort of yeah. take up the line of discussion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so. I think the, the direction that I uh, may want to go in, given timing, et cetera, is to ask all of you, and I, I have a draft letter that I've yet to share with the committee and others, just to spend some time this summer, uh, early fall, kind of delving into some of these issues, some of these questions that you've heard from us, some of the concerns you've heard from me about around governance, around voices, around how can we be, you know, create a, a more democratic process, if you will? And, you know, from where I'm sitting, realistically, I don't see personally, and the chair may disagree or others may disagree, doing that in two days. But I think what I would appreciate, if, if you were willing to consider a robust uh, uh, conversation over the summer with, with stakeholders, with folks in your office, and to come back and respond to some of these questions that I've started to outline. And I think the committee will also sort of add to that, uh, to that, to that letter. So that, that's where I'm at, Mr. Chair, uh, realistically yeah. and uh, practically. And, and I don't know if that's something the commissioner would be comfortable with, uh, but I'll, I'll leave it there. Would you like me to respond? I'd, I'd love for you to respond. Yes, I, I say, think that is a... Uh, I think that's a, a reasonable and, and um, well thought out approach. Um, and it's in alignment. I can skip a lot of my testimony now um, because I believe that's the direction the department should be heading in, in any event, regardless of any action or lack of action taken uh, by this committee or others. 
Um, we do recognize at the department that we need, there are differing voices that we need to make sure feel like they're being heard. Um, and so there are a number of ways uh, to do that. I don't have them all fleshed out now, but I think what you're talking about is codifying that a little bit um, and working, ensuring that we do uh, move in that direction uh, over the summer so that when we have these issues, a couple things can happen, hopefully. My goal would be one, that we have conversations like this among disparate views and viewpoints and um, that there's a uh, 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 an effort on all parties to understand uh, where the other folks might be coming from. And at least if there's better understanding, more dialogue, um, and then look at how, uh, how we incorporate that into the decision-making. So if it's, if it's okay with the chair, what I'll do is I'll share the letter with committee members, see if others wanna to add to it, and then we can have you take a look at it as well uh, and see if, if there might be a, you know, a path forward for that. Because you know, just in terms of good governance, I, I don't see how we could, could really have this, this in-depth of a conversation in a couple of days when we have uh, you know, competing priorities. So this would give us some, some real information from which to build on next year. So if you're willing, uh, I'd appreciate that. Great. Uh, thanks, Senator Campion. Yeah. Um, you know, as we've talked about the nature of the Fish and Wildlife Board and for, so some people call it a, a board of, its, of consumptive, uh, I'm not really that fond of these terms, consumptive and non-consumptive members uh, of the sort of Fish and Wildlife community or citizens. Um, but I'm just, can you say a little bit about so it makes complete sense to me that if you are talking about consumption, you would have people who have expertise in it if you're just talking about means of tape, et cetera. But for people who want to have a broader discussion about non-consumptive values, what's the four? So I don't know if there's a counterpart for the non-consumptive people to participate in in the current fish and wildlife department. Uh, well, I don't know that there's that. anything. Was that directed at me? Yes, please. Thank I, you. I don't know that there's anything formal that I can point to. There are, I can assure you, a lot of informal communications uh, that come into the department. Uh, you're not uh, the only folks that get many emails. Uh, I certainly do. And I read um, almost everyone as long as time commits, permits. But in, in terms of moving forward, kind of the, the stuff I'm thinking about, the things that we could do, um, you know, uh, a wildlife congress where we bring in a facilitator and talk about issues. Uh, you know, here's the one thing I'll say. We all start with common ground. Um, I, I don't believe anybody who is writing emails to the Department of Fish and Wildlife, myself, or you, um, is doing so because they don't have uh, a care or passion about the wildlife and uh, you know the natural communities um, in Vermont. And so everybody at least acknowledges, hey, we all do care um, and remain in that, that space then when we have discussions, uh, whether they're facilitated, maybe having regular meetings, not about a specific topic that's on the, on the docket, but just to have, and I know this is gonna sound very academic, but just having discussions for the sake of having discussion, a philosophical discussion. Let's just talk about it, um, come together, but with guidelines, and you know that uh, you know, like any facilitated communication, that is uh, within the scope of good decorum and mutual respect. And those are the kind of things that I'm endeavoring to do as we move forward. Um, and that can take on different uh, 
It can be Zoom calls like this. It could be in person. Um, and so I think that's that's what we we need to do. And sometimes having those general discussions, not focused on hound hunting of coyotes, not focusing on a specific bill, allows people to maybe listen. And, and, um, and so that, that's what I'm looking at. In terms of creating a whole new um, system or I'm not sure we're there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Campion, any other follow-up? No, you know, I would just say, you know, it's possible we may create a whole new system, but I think first we've got to get this information and, and have a process and, uh, but yeah, we may find out that, that we, we may not, but one thing's for sure, we, we can't do it by Friday. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Got that. Yeah. All right. Thank um, you. Thanks, Commissioner. Thank, thank you. Uh, Mr. Storo, you are uh, on our screen. So good morning. Thanks for coming in. You were one of the people who first spoke to us about S-129. Uh, so you, you've heard what Tenor Campy brought up, sort of a change of approach. I don't know if you have any thoughts to share with the committee. Um, first of all, Chuck Storo here on behalf of the Vermont Wildlife Coalition. And I want to say at the outset, I'm getting messages that my internet connection is unstable. So I was actually offline there for a moment and didn't hear all of the prior conversation. Um, you know, we do support S129 uh, wholeheartedly. Um, I'm glad to hear, you know, the department speaking out sort of to broaden um, input and so forth and really don't have a, you know, a, a qualm with that. I guess this whole notion, though, that the Fish and Wildlife Board should be the sole authority when it comes to uh, the rule around hunting, trapping, and fishing is being sacrosanct. I don't buy that. We don't buy that. Uh, the, you know, under S-129, the Fish and Wildlife Board would be converted into an advisory body its input would become part of the rulemaking process. Um, and we think that's appropriate because in the final analysis, the department has the expertise and the scientific background on these issues. And it should be the final uh, authority with, with respect to uh, rules around hunting, fishing and trapping. And given the fact that the uh, board in its advisory capacity would have input um, into the rulemaking process and we think that that would be preferable. And frankly, you know, S-129 is a reaction to the fact that um, the board has consistently stiff-armed petitions to do things like establish a five-month coyote hunting season uh, as opposed to the current 365 days, um, well-reasoned, well-thought-out, well-presented petition and the board just votes without any justification or uh, explanation to deny the petition. Um, you know, and, and the other many other examples in that regard. So um, there's a lot of folks who've lost faith in the board. Um, it seems to be, uh, you know, uh, taking a narrow approach of only consumptive uses of wildlife. And, um, you know, this bill is a reaction to that. And we think beyond that, it would lead, lead to better governance um, in, in connection with wildlife management, uh, setting the wildlife management policies. Um, the board, as it's currently set up, is largely unaccountable. Um, they get six years terms and they can do whatever they want. Um, and, um, and they've been doing that. And so there's a lot of frustration out there. And um, I hear the commissioner saying he hears that and we appreciate that. But um, you know, I, I sort of feel like we're being rope doped a little bit, to, you know, to go off on other paths. And S-129 is, you know, fully formed, um, well thought out and, and, you know, sort of just constructed and something that could be moved by this Friday. And we would urge you to do that. And I heard a lot about the, the, S-281, and I could say some things about that, but I'm not listed as a witness, so. Um, in, in well, this... we're, we're not too formal, and time is right. short, so if you want to speak to 281 while you're here, that would be great. 
Yeah, I mean, first of all, I want to just say, I don't think the Vermont Constitution protects the right to use dogs to hunt. So the notion that you have a constitutional right to use dogs in connection with hunting, no. You have a right to, to, to hunt yourself as a human being on unposted property, but that doesn't include the right to use dogs. And, and you know, and, and uh, some of the things that were in, I mean, I didn't have a chance to really study the commissioner's proposed language, but the notion that, you know, um, if somebody has told you not to run hounds on your property, then you can't do that. You were going to the Senator Bray. Well, you know, you have to know where those hounders are and go out proactively and say, hey, I don't want you hunting hounds on, uh, on my property. Um, you know, what's going to happen is, is that you'll discover hounders on your property and you will have that conversation and maybe they will abide by it going forward, but they've already done it. Um, the, the rule should be, the default rule should be basically don't use hounds to, to chase coyotes, period. But short of that, um, if you're going to use hounds, whether you're hunting uh, um, uh, coyotes or bears, you should have written permission from the landowner, any and all landowners, that those hounds may go on to, to be on their land. And there's no constitutional right to run those hounds uh, everywhere. And if you, don't, and you can't get that permission, tough. You know, you need to control your hounds. You don't need to know where they are. And you need to be in an area where they're not going to be on people's land um, without that written permission. And, and that's just the way it is. There's no need to use hounds period, really. There is no need to hunt coyotes to begin with. And, and um, the folks from the department are correct. Kim Royer has got the right attitude about coyote hunting. So what are we doing here? Why are we shooting coyotes? They're not hurting the deer herd. They reproduce to replace themselves. It's just about shooting animals for the heck of it. And so why are we countenancing that, much less running dogs on them? So I'll stop um, there. Right. Well, thank you. Um, we have one concern I have about uh, having a, an explicit burden on the property owner to inform the person with the hounds that are trespassing that they don't want that is, uh, one, I think it puts people in a confrontational position that a lot of people are not comfortable with. And, um, Frankly, from talking to some people, I think they have, they felt uh, a little, yeah, they felt at least uncomfortable confronting the people that were um, using hounds, hunting through their property. So, uh, so it's part of the reason that we have law enforcement, so that you can call on law enforcement to neutrally and professionally address the situation. All right, um, so uh, Mr. Storrow, any other comments? Thanks for hanging in for the morning. Uh, I don't know if you have anything else you wanna share with the committee? Well, um, you know, like I said, I don't think there's anything necessarily sacrosanct about having the Fish and Wildlife Board be the final authority with respect to rulemaking around um, hunting, fishing, and angling. And, um, you know, we certainly recognize that it's good to have citizen input from a board on these issues, but um, given the track record, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not working. Um, and um, to giving them that final authority because they just deny everything left, right, and center that they feel encroaches on um, the right to do, you know, the things that are currently done out there in the field. And a lot of those things are not uh, going well with people. Uh, other Vermonters. It doesn't take into account other viewpoints. And so we would urge you to move forward with S129. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts. On, you know, I was talking a little bit a few moments ago about that notion of uh, the board speaking with knowledge on consumptive issues and that non-consumptive points of view might be part of a different forum. Uh, but I'm not so sure they neatly fall into that. You know, I, I have the feeling that if you were drawing a Venn diagram, 
there's an overlap between those two circles. And I don't know if that means that the non-consumptive perspectives that would fall into that overlapping area aren't reaching the Fish and Wildlife Board, or if they are being presented that they're being, uh, at least in the opinion of the non-consumptive members, heard and responded to. I think that's part of our difficulty. I understand. I think I understand what you're saying, Senator, but I will also point out that there's some people who would fall within the so-called consumptive camp, um, including myself, uh, who's hunted for over 50 years, um, who don't believe in some things that the Fish and Wildlife Board uh, doesn't want to work on. Um, so it's it's not like it's it's black and white. Um yeah, there's some folks out there who value wildlife and don't hunt at all. Um, there's people who value wildlife and hunt, but don't kill animals uh, without using them. That's a fundamental tenet of ethical hunting, which is if you shoot it, you eat it or you wear it, period. Um, and then there's people who think, yeah, uh, coyotes are varmints. Shoot them on sight. So... You know, you got a broad range out there. Um, well, thank you. Any committee questions for Mr. Uh, Storm? Right. And uh, Ms. Guessing, you've been saying on, on screen, I don't know if you have any uh, last remarks on the part of the department to share with us before we wrap for the morning. Okay, thanks very much. So uh, with that, we're coming up on 12, and I think uh, that we are adjourned for the morning. <laughs>